When it comes to doing things in the name of science, there's not a lot people aren't willing to try. Whether it involves violations of safety protocols or wanton disregard for laws and ethics, or even experimenting on oneself, the prospect of scientific progress and the greater good can often be seen to outweigh the potential consequences. Sometimes this results in amazing scientific advances, and sometimes it results in the MK Ultra program. Today we're going to be looking at scientific experiments that had disastrous results. The Demon Core. On August the 13th, 1945, the United States scheduled the third atomic bomb to be dropped on Japan. It was expected that the bomb would be ready by the 16th and dropped on the 19th, but this would fortunately never come to pass. On August the 15th, Japan surrendered. The bomb was no longer necessary, and it was going to remain at Los Alamos. With the radioactive core of the bomb no longer scheduled to explode, it was time for some reckless scientific experimentation. Radioactive material goes critical when it's able to sustain a nuclear chain reaction without any outside intervention. As that process speeds up, it's known as as going super critical. Scientists already knew how to trigger criticality of the material within the bomb, but they understood a lot less outside of the applications of war. The first nuclear power plant was still six years away, and better understanding exactly where the line was at which the material would go critical would be an important step toward realizing more efficient global energy. The easiest way to generate a reaction using the radioactive core was to reflect the neutrons that it shed back onto itself. On August the 21st, physicist Harry Darlian of the Manhattan Project was doing just that. He was building a reflective wall of tungsten carbide bricks around the core and measuring the results. Each new brick brought the core closer to criticality. As Harry went to place another brick on the wall, he dropped it. The brick landed on top of the core, leaving it surrounded with neutron reflective material. Harry removed the brick as quickly as possible, but it was too late. For that moment, the core had gone supercritical and Harry received a lethal dose of radiation. He died 25 days later of acute radiation poisoning. Nearly a year later, physicist Louis Slotin was experimenting with the core again. He had been working on the Manhattan Project and was a friend of Harry's. Given Harry's untimely death, you might think that Louis would have been a bit more careful than his late friends, but well, there was science to be done and he was needlessly arrogant. In the new experiments, the core was placed inside two half spheres of beryllium to reflect the neutrons back on itself. There were supposed to be two shims to keep the halves separate, but Lewis had no interest in using those. Instead, he would perform the experiments by sliding a flathead screwdriver between the two halves to keep them from completely sealing. He had performed experiments in this way nearly a dozen times, so one might think that he'd gotten the hang of it. Others, however, would think that he was an absolute lunatic that should know better. Enrico Fermi said that they would all be dead within a year if they kept performing such experiments in such an unsafe manner, and Richard Feynman compared their experiments to tickling the tail of a sleeping dragon. As literally everybody predicted, something eventually went wrong. Lewis was performing his experiment, manipulating the sphere and taking Geiger counter readings when the screwdriver slipped outward. The two halves of the sphere immediately slammed shut and the core once again went supercritical. Lewis ripped the top half of the sphere off and threw it to the floor, but he knew it was too late. In both supercritical events, there was a flash of blue light, followed by a feeling of incredible warmth as if radiating outward from each person's body. On May the 26th, 1946, after Lewis dropped the beryllium sphere to the ground, the first words he uttered were, well, that does it. He saw what had happened to his friend Harry, and he knew he was already dead. Nine days later, he died of acute radiation poisoning. Harry was alone for the first incident, but there were seven others in the room for the second. Others would become hospitalized with severe radiation poisoning, but ultimately they would all recover. Scientists are not generally superstitious people, but after these two events, the Corps was given the nickname the Demon Corps on account of the lives that it had claimed. The Demon Corps was intended to be detonated in nuclear tests later that year, but due to delays and cancellations with the tests, that didn't happen. Instead, rather than keep the cursed Demon Corps around any longer than necessary, it was melted down and recycled to be used in other nuclear cause. Scientist Stick's Head and Particle Accelerator 
If you asked a random physicist on the street what would happen if you stuck your head in the Large Hadron Collider, there's a good chance they'd just laugh and tell you that they don't know, but that it's probably a bad idea. The scientists working at the site itself are much more confident in the result, having already placed sheets of metal in front of the beam to see the holes it will tear through the metal. Obviously, the soft tissue of your hand would stand no chance for such a high-powered beam. So what if you put your head in there? On July the 13th, 1978, 36-year-old Russian scientist Anatoly Bogorsky was working at the Institute for High Energy Physics in Protvino in the then Soviet Union. It was the home of the largest particle accelerator in the Soviet Union, the U-70 synchrotron, and it was Anatoly's job to fix a malfunctioning piece of equipment. What Anatoly didn't know was that the equipment he intended to fix was not the only part of the particle accelerator that was malfunctioning. The warning lights had broken during a previous experiment and were never fixed. Without those warning lights, he had had no reason to believe that the beam of highly energized protons was still traveling through the accelerator's tunnel. As he leaned his head into the machine, he immediately knew what had happened. Anatoly said that he didn't feel any pain, but that he saw a flash of light brighter than a thousand suns. But this was the Soviet Union, so he wasn't going to tell anyone what had happened. Instead, he completed his work, presumably after making sure that the accelerator really was shut off this time, and then he went home for the evening. The incident itself may not have been painful. But the aftermath absolutely was. The left side of Anatoly's face began to swell dramatically, and after a brutal sleepless night, he finally decided to seek medical attention. He was rushed to a special clinic in Moscow, which treated the victims of radiation. There, the doctors assumed he only had days to live. While the exact amount of ionizing radiation that Anatoly was exposed to cannot be known for sure, some sources estimate that he absorbed as much as 750 times the lethal dose of radiation. Estimates vary dramatically, but there's no disputing the fact that he experienced significantly more than a lethal dose of radiation. As the days went on, the skin where the concentrated energy beam had entered and Natalie's skull and exited through the left side of his face peeled away, revealing exactly what had happened. The beam had burned a thin hole directly through his head. Brain, bone, skin, and muscle were all burned away as the beam passed through his head. However, despite the predictions of the doctors and most logical guesses as to the outcome, Natalie is still alive today at the age of 79. Despite the exceptionally high dose of radiation, due to the nature of it being such a concentrated beam, Anatoly was able to survive. That's not to say that there weren't consequences. Despite the whole burn through his brain, Anatoly's intellect seemed to remain intact. He finished his work earning his PhD and continued his work as a physicist at the Institute. The main change intellectually was only that he found mental exertion much more tiring than he previously had. Another unwanted side effect of the hole drilled through his brain was seizures. Anatoly would occasionally suffer from complex partial seizures. This is the type of seizure where a person seems to momentarily stare off into space as if they're thinking extremely hard or just really don't care what you're trying to tell them. On rare occasions, he would also suffer tonic-clonic seizures, the sort of full-on seizures where people fall to the ground and start convulsing. He would also find that the left half of his face eventually became paralyzed and he became deaf in his left ear. The deafness was accompanied by tinnitus, a common but extremely annoying symptom of hearing loss. One particular medical oddity, as if this entire case wasn't odd enough, is that the left half of Anatoly's face seemed to stop aging. The right half of his face continued to age normally, but the paralyzed side seemed almost completely free of the expected effects of aging. It was over a decade before the Soviet Union would fall and Anatoly would be able to speak publicly about what had happened to him. Citizens of Western countries might think that this guy had hit the workman's comp jackpot, but such was not the case in the Soviet Union or indeed Russia. In 1996, Anatoly applied for disability status that would allow him to receive his anti-seizure medication for free, but his claim was denied. He also expressed interest in making himself available for study by Western scientists, but he could not afford to leave Propvino. Of course, we opened this entry by talking about what would happen if you stuck your hand inside the Large Hadron Collider. To date, Anatoly is the only human to be exposed to an active particle accelerator beam, so we can only guess the exact results. But for a frame of reference, the U-70 synchrotron had only about 1% of the energy output of CERN's Large Hadron Collider. Doctor gives himself the wrong STD. Born in 1728, John Hunter was a well-respected British surgeon who studied various areas of medicine from bloodletting to venereal disease. John was actively working during a time period when it's very common for doctors and scientists to just experiment on themselves. Although it has been reported for over a century that John experimented on himself, there are relatively recent claims to the contrary, believing it to just be a myth. Whether the experiment was performed on himself or a third party, the effects were the same. In 1767, John was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of 
London for improving natural knowledge. At the time, he was considered to be the leading authority on venereal diseases. He also believed that gonorrhea and syphilis were the same disease, and that gonorrhea was just the earlier stage of syphilis. If true, this would have been a massive breakthrough. London's population had exploded in the 1700s. This increased population brought with it a sharp increase in sex workers, and since condoms didn't exist yet, sexually transmitted diseases were a hot topic. Because both gonorrhea and syphilis are bacterial infections, they're both curable today with the right antibiotics. However, in John's day, only gonorrhea was treatable. Syphilis, on the other hand, could cause severe neurological symptoms and ultimately death. It was known that syphilis had multiple stages and took a long time to become fatal. So if it could be proven that gonorrhea really was just the same disease but in the earlier stage, then the aggressive treatment of gonorrhea could wind up saving lives. We now know that it couldn't be proven because they're not the same disease, but John had a theory and he needed to test it. Taking pus from the sore of a boy infected with gonorrhea, John intentionally injected himself with the disease. If the infection turned into syphilis, he would know that his theory was correct. The only problem with the experiment is that, unbeknownst to John, the subject from whom he had acquired the pus was actually afflicted with both diseases. The results were devastating. First of all, John accidentally gave himself a deadly STD, which is, well, not ideal. Aside from inadvertently injecting himself with a contagious death sentence, which would be bad enough, it invalidated his entire study. That's all pretty bad already, but even worse is that he never found out what he had done. For his entire life, John thought the approved gonorrhea and syphilis really were the same disease. Because he was so well respected and was the leading authority on venereal disease, his findings were taken as fact. Knowledge regarding the two diseases was set back, and it would be another 51 years before French doctor Philippe Bricot would prove what a blunder John had made. John had also recommended treating syphilis by burning the sores and treating them with mercury, which begs the question of how he had become the leading expert in that field in the first place. Though John's A Treatise on the Venereal Disease does not explicitly state that his experiment was performed on himself, it doesn't make reference to a third party either. The end result was the same either way, but it's hard not to hope that John had experimented on himself. The only thing worse than setting back STD research by over half a century by injecting yourself with a deadly disease would be to set it back by injecting somebody else. And when the doctor's theory is, if I inject you with gonorrhea, it will develop into syphilis, it's hard to imagine there were many volunteers lining up for that experiment. Thank <laughs> you.